We return now for the last talk in this session to philosophy, if I see that correctly. It's Marius, please. I'm going to embarrass Diana while she mics me up, because like my, like my predecessors, uh, I should really start by thanking her and Sini. Uh, most of us couldn't organize a ham sandwich if our lives depend on it, and to do something of this scale and to make it run so smoothly, having tried something like that myself and failed miserably, it takes so much competence and love and devotion for Jed that, uh, you know, I feel humbled to be here. And I'm sure it's not lost on Jed just how, you know, how much people treasure who he is and what he's done for us that they were willing to put up with the logistics and the sheer stress of organizing this, this thing. Uh, thank you. So thank you, thank you from all of us. And uh, thank you. And also extend the thanks to all the wonderful people who've uh, nurtured and mentored my early career at Caltech. I was immensely, immensely lucky to the extent that there is anything valuable about what I do in my research. I'm basically running on fumes from a fuel, a full tank of fuel that I accumulated at uh, Caltech. First from Chris Hitchcock who believed in me when, you know, he had very little to go by just a, you know, a graduate student's application dossier. And then from the wonderful historians of science who taught me everything about the history of physics that I, if it's true, I learned it from them. If it's false, I must have read it somewhere, somewhere else. Um, so um, thank you all and on a, you know, self exculpatory note, it's easy for me to answer the question philosophy when desirable because in virtue of the, my research topics, it's still counted as natural philosophy. So I study the you know, Western classical physics before the divorce, as it were, before the couple decided to, you know, uh, philosophy to get left out of the loop and physics or classical physics that decided that I can actually do without you just fine. Um, watching uh, my predecessors yesterday, I realized that there is something that I could call with legitimacy the Buchwald School of uh, History of Physics. Because it turns out that I learned about the same figures and themes and problems that Craig Fraser and uh, Diane learned to from Jed. So I'm possibly a third generation descendant of the book, Buchwald School. What I, uh, in addition to the history of the entire classical physics that I learned from Jed, what's been especially useful for my own uh, contribution, um, my own research is either the scholarship that he's done directly or via the people he trained into the history that Trustel chose to lay, leave out for various reasons, either because it didn't fit with his agenda of, you know, elevating Euler on a, on a pedestal, or because he had the wrong ideas of analytic mechanics and uh, its genesis and what analytic mechanics is good for. Thankfully, jo uh, Jed knew better, so he guided uh, scholars of the highest quality that have now given us an idea of what early and high modern analytic mechanics amounts to that even us philosophers have, uh, have found ways to benefit from it. In particular, their research has helped me discover that there are still certain open problems in, uh, in the philosophy of classical physics, which by the way, despite uh, hasty obituaries, it's as alive uh, as ever, especially as classical mechanics itself has grown explosively after Einstein's supposed you know, demise or you know, putting it to rest, as it were. 
thanks in virtue of, uh, thanks primarily to researches in uh, the kinetic theory of matter and material science, classical mechanics is now a really very rapidly growing field of research. Uh, in terms of the philosophical aspects or underpinnings, the problems lurking behind the, beneath the foundations of classical mechanics, uh, I, my research focuses on these four in particular. There's probably more than that. Uh, there's also the question of inertial kinematic structure, but there are people in a much better position than me to explore it, and that has a, has a tradition behind it already. Um, a problem that I was able to discover just because Jed's uh, disciples and himself have done the actual historical work or unco of uncovering this extremely difficult part of classical mechanics, the part that makes Newton look like child's play. Uh, so one problem that stands out as soon as you read the history of mechanics after Newton is that the underlying ontology, what the canonical object of classical mechanics is supposed to be about. Pro oh, I see, I see. Sorry. Uh, I switch to teaching mode, and when I teach, I pace around in the classroom, or else my students might just like start snoring, and that's it. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, so I tend to move around quite a bit, at least to you know, keep them awake because it's not easy. Uh, after Newton, you see three different ontologies, three different canonical objects, each of them being the, you know, the basis for an ontology for mechanics, arise as early as 1703, I would say. Another question that you don't see unless you get serious, serious to, the to a degree that Jed would approve of, about the history of mechanics after Newton is that epistemologically speaking, it enters a sort of, of a long and early crisis situation. It's not really clear what counts as evidence in mechanics if you descend below the moon and try to do the mechanical theory of you know, objects that aren't as well behaved and neatly separated as planets where gravity and large distances make it into an extremely well-behaved system for you. So in, from that perspective, Newton had the easy task, as it were. First, because as Newell has taught us, uh, there were 2,200 years of reliable data that he was able to draw on. There was a long tradition of isolating what counts as effective parameters for mechanical theorizing. But that was his lucky break, because again, gravitational systems are well behaved. When you try to do the mechanics of you know, blood coursing through our veins, rubber uh, you know, stretching, glass breaking as you drop it on the floor, these guys had none of Newton's advantages, as it were. So they were pretty much flying blindly by the seat of their pants. And for a reason that I haven't yet answered, their priority becomes deriving differential equations of motions for various you know, manageable systems in classical mechanics. But you cannot test them empirically. Until late Victorian physics at the earliest, there's no way to gather reliable evidence for equations of motion that tell you how a parameter changes at a point over an instant. So what counted as evidence you know, what made, where truth enters classical mechanics if you move past gravitation theory, that's a theory, uh, that's a problem that, you know, for at least two centuries remains open. It's a separating wound, as it were. But again, you don't get to see unless you actually engage with the researches in the history of mechanics that the Buckwald School has done. Another philosophical problem that you glimpse, but only if you get serious about the history of 18th and 19th century mechanics, is that what we count now, what we call dynamic, the dynamical laws of classical equations, and the ver of classical mechanics, and the very structure of mechanical theory as a taxonomic system of differential equations, make 
make it extremely difficult to answer the question in what sense this theory that counted as the queen of sciences for well over 200 years is a theory of causes and effects. The overt talk of the makers of mechanics and especially the, of the philosophers who thought they knew something about classical mechanics continues to be one of mechanics as the science of causes. But when you inspect the form of the theory, uh, causation seems to have been flushed out of it entirely. And it becomes really a sort of porf porphyrian tree of equality assertions between functions and differential operators on them. Another problem that you see again, if you get serious about the, the early history of mechanics after Newton is that in their effort to, to, cr to create a properly general theory of mechanical interactions, which they thought neither Newton nor Leibniz nor Huygens had been able to bequeath to them, they get to be so successful that by 1800, you have at least three different candidates of general principles of mechanics or general dynamical laws as they, as they called them back then. There's the least action or extremal action principles tradition. There's the so-called Newton-Euler-Cauchy tradition in which impressed force and torque. Uh, so by 1800, you can already see that, you know, a sort of duem quine problem lurks around the corner for classical theory. They have too much foundations and not enough evidence, empirical evidence, to distinguish between these three different uh, candidates. I won't inflict all of it on you. Uh, one of the, the problems that I, you know, open philosophical problems that I detected in classical theory as early as 1760, you don't need to wait until M Mark Wilson and late 20th century Pittsburgh reflections on the structure of classical mechanics is that by 1800, again, thanks to researches by Craig Fraser and uh, other scholars, uh, other students of Jed who've investigated the problem, you get three different objects that are held to be, you know, considered to be canonical objects for mechanics. One is the mass point. We all know what that is, what, what it looks like. I haven't seen one, but you know, we learned the theory of this little guy in Mechanics 101. The rigid body enters the scene primarily either as an effort to handle constrained system mechanics with Clairaut and D'Alembert in the French, or when they realize that the Earth moves in ways that treating the Earth as a particle, as a mass point, is not sharp enough to you can't even make sense of nutation and precession if you treat the Earth as a mass point, as Newton had done. And uh, finally, they try to make sense of the ways in which water and air or, you know, elastic -y stuff moves when you exert forces on them. So yet a third object enters the picture of classical mechanics. Now, the thing is that, rigorously speaking, None of these objects can be eliminated, gotten rid of by, you know, explanatory reduction or it can't, you can't define any of them away and be left with just two or one ontology. They're irreducible to each other. So you, you're facing the fact that you have three candidates for what ought if you think that classical mechanics is the theory of, you know, one kind of body, the cla material objects in classical regimes, you have three different candidates for what would be what you might think of as the fundamental object, out of which everything else, visible objects, for instance, is built up by, you know, physical composition or assembly. So it's not clear, it's still not clear to us whether classical mechanics has a single ontology or three, as it were. But I would like to suggest that this problem was apparent if philosophers had paid closer attention to the evolution of mechanics in the 18th century, you could see this pro problem by 1800 already. So you don't need, in a sense, 
to wait for late Victorian and pre-Einstein, you know, awakenings from dogmatic slumbers when philosophers or people who claimed to be doing history decided, let's take a long, hard look at this thing that for a long while we've taken to be the glory of Western knowledge, as it were, the classical theory of mechanics. We all know what they said or what they thought they discovered, that causation seems to have no role in classical mechanics, that uh, Mach allegedly, that Newton was wrong in all kinds of ways. The problem is that even when these people claimed to be doing philosophical reflection historic or based on historical sources, they weren't quite telling the truth or they were naive, we should say, let's be charitable. To they were naive about just how complicated and rich that history of the theory they were examining. Critish, just as how complicated and rich that history is and just how preliminary work it would take to come to terms with this, the history of 300 years of mechanical theory building. We only know this again in retrospect because we've been lucky enough to you know, know the actual history thanks to Jed's work and thanks to you know, some of his wonderful graduate students who then went on to become world authorities in the history of post-Newtonian classical mechanics. But, uh, well, so the important message was, control and minus. Sorry about that. No. So this said, must the owl, the owl of Minerva fly at dusk? Uh, a riff on Hegel, who thinks you know philosophical insight comes when pretty much the whole, the most interesting part of the business is over. When it's all over, but the fighting, as my Irish chair tells me, they say in Ireland. <laughs> Uh, philosophy swoops in to, you know, draw some general lessons to provide a sort of retrospective light. I want to say that if the philosophers had really followed closely the history of classical mechanics, we, need, we wouldn't need to wait until late Victorian physics or even early 21st century reflections at Pittsburgh and Caltech and on the East Coast we have seen that classical mechanics was riddled, was always in foundational crisis, as it were. Uh, it, it began as early as 1703 when Jacob Bernoulli wrote his paper on, on the compound pendulum. There's more coming out of these, uh, you know, quick, quick and dirty presentations of what I've been up to, but it's all thanks to historical scholarship of the highest grade that, uh, you know, Jed and his students have have created, so thank you again, and thank you for all the chances that I, I've been given.